very appropriate book for our time. There are times when the people of God are not precise enough. They're not precise enough in their spiritual posture. Not focused enough. Because of that, they're in a time when they're very vulnerable to the ploys of Satan <coughs> and the influences of the flesh. Now, during times like this, glar glaring and notable sins may not be found in them, but they're not sensitive enough. They're not tender enough. They're not serious enough. Not zeal enough in their effort, zealous enough in their efforts to lay hold on eternal life. Their doctrine may be precise. They may be even, may be even repulsed by false doctrines and have a certain disdain for them. But they're not alert enough to detect unseen enemies. Unseen enemies that are active, active in trying to capture them, enslave them. At the head of this motley bunch is Satan who's the prince of the power of the air. There's the demonic world that are originating false doctrines called doctrines of demons. There are a higher order of op 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 opponents, principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places in the rulers of the darkness of this world. These are active opponents. If a person is unalert or is dull or is slow or is retarded in their response, these forces will overpower them. And when a person first comes into Christ, it is true, they are protected. But this is not intended to be a long-range situation. Aside from the enemies that I just mentioned, which are very formidable, there's the flesh that lusts against the spirit all the time. You'll not go a day or a portion of a day where this will not be going on. The flesh lusting against the spirit, what that means is the flesh will introduce competing <laughs> desires. Desires that compete with where the spirit wants to lead you, what the spirit wants to teach you, and there's other things that interfere with that, see, in your flesh. Things that interfere, rise up against it. And there's evil communications that corrupt good manners. There's associations that yeah. knock the edge off a person's love and so forth. They corrupt good manners. A lot of people don't really know how to make friends. They don't. They're too sloppy at it. And if you have a hard time about it with this, Satan will throw all kind of things at you, thinking that, and you'll think you're having an advantage in having these associations. With it's a disadvantage. It's the kind of thing you can't define. You can't write a book about this and give it to somebody. You, ha you have to maintain your sensitivity to God. You have to do it. There can also be a first love that maybe it was unintentional, but you left it. 
you quite frankly, you don't love Jesus as much as you did. Well, it happens slowly, probably, but this has introduced a kind of a spiritual neurosis, which is a spiritual virus that makes you less aware of uh, harmful things. You have less perception of reality. What you think is real may not be real at all. It may be nothing more than imagination. When what's very, very real, you may think that's an imagination. And, and this diminished spiritual capacity brings about that condition. The kind of situation Jude addresses in his this brief but pungent epistle, he's addressing that kind of situation. A full-blown fair had fallen away hadn't taken place, but they were headed in that direction. But apparently none of them knew they were. Now this is a very sensitive matter to me that uh, I'm talking about because I've witnessed some deterioration. It's a, it's a, well, you'll just see from the book what are you, what you have to do about it. He, these people that he's writing to, and it's not a particular group of people, it's apparently a group of scattered people, like where Book of Hebrews is written, First, Second Peter written to the kind of dispersed, James written to a dispersed, people, all who had this same difficulty, the influences that they were under had led them to receive among them people with damning influences, and they were actually part of their assemblies. But they were, they were like clouds that didn't have water. And they were like trees that didn't have fruit. So Jude writes them to awake them out of this slumber because they were too sleepy, see? Or their eyes were, they were too nearsighted. They couldn't, they couldn't see what was happening. But Jude saw what, Jude saw what was happening. And he's writing about it with expertise that comes from godly wisdom and a fervent desire to correct things, he try, he's chipping at this lethargic crust yeah. that has grown over the people's hearts. Yeah, yeah. It's not thick right now, uh -huh. but if somebody doesn't break it, it'll soon it'll stifle life altogether. Yeah, right. There are spiritual cataracts that are forming on their eyes, yeah. so they can't see as clearly as they once, once did. And he's going to uh, address that with very, very much expertise. Uh, tonight we're going to be we're going to introduce verse one. There's a lot in this verse. There's a, there's a lot that's controversial. There's a lot that people haven't agreed on, but all of that is of no consequence to me. I want to understand the verse whether anybody else ever did or not. Of course, I'm not the only one. I understand others have, but you can't be guided by. You've got to have a sense of what this thing is saying and be able to take hold of it. So this epistle is from a person named Jude. Now, Jude is a, translated from a Greek word has translated a number of different ways, the same exact same word, exact same name. It's translated Judas. There are a number of men named Judas, but there's one famous Judas. Mm -hmm. Judas. I give you the place where these are found. It's translated Judah with, with one A. It's translated Judah with A-H. And it's translated Jude. Now it's all the same, same name. 
Later versions consistently translate it Judah. Strong's dictionary, Greek dictionary, gives the use of the above word as Judas, Jehuda, Judah with A, Judah, A H, and Jude. Exact same name, translated different ways. I was generally agreed, and I think this is right, that this was done to distinguish the personalities because there's such a diversity of personalities that had this same name. You've got Judah, the son of Jacob, that's one. You've got the one, a faith, one faithful apostle was named Judas. And there was an unfaithful apostle, Judas, who betrayed Jesus. Then there's a brother of James, and the half-brother of Jesus, whose name was Jude. Now the distinction between these personalities is so significant that some of the translators, and I, I applaud them for doing this, they, they, they wrote it down differently. It means the same thing, but they wrote it down differently to help us to distinguish. If, if, there's, if it was always translated Judas, well, this would, this would cause a cause some problems. So I applaud them for being sensitive enough to do that because this kind of sensitivity is not in modern translators. They don't have this much, this kind of sensitivity. They haven't changed the text. They haven't violated any principles of interpretation. But they know these personalities are so different, they, they phrased it, they said, they said it different, all meaning the same thing. Now this was the half-brother of Jesus. Most conservative theologians agree to this. He's mentioned in Matthew 13, 55, where the brothers of Jesus, the brothers meaning Mary's children through Joseph, as compared to virginity, virgin bearing Jesus. is mentioned are James and Joseph, which is another way of saying Joseph, Simon and Judas. And as I mentioned by saying half-brother, we mean this, these were the children Mary had and his sisters are also mentioned in Matthew 13, 56 and Mark 6, 3. He has some sisters too. It doesn't, their names and number aren't, aren't mentioned. These were the children she had through Joseph. Now this has, of course, caused a lot of trouble with the Catholic theologians who insist that they were cousins. Yeah. But this is a lot of gobbledygook. Because right. this was the very point that he offended the people in his hometown. Amen. It wasn't that he had cousins. Yeah. Yeah. Now here's what it, here's what it, says they were offended at, at Jesus. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and of Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. <laughs> that couldn't be talking about distant relatives. I mean, you've got to be fundamentally dishonest. Yeah, right. Jews weren't offended at people's cousins mm -hmm. and distant relatives. Mm -hmm. They were offended mm -hmm. at the idea that Jesus was more like God than like them. Mm -hmm. this, this was a, an offensive, mm -hmm. this was an offensive thought. Their opinion uh, of Jesus was their, they were raised with him. These brothers were raised up with Jesus. How, how many years, we don't know, but it was considerable because he was made known at 30. He was revealed publicly at 30. So they were raised up with Jesus for some years. They should have been among the first people to have believed on Jesus. 
They should have seen its uniqueness. They should have went to their mother and asked about it. What does this show you? The divinity of Jesus was not clearly seen in his perfect humanity. Amen. Uh -huh. yeah, we, may, we may see it because it's been revealed, but it was not. Jesus had to say something before anybody knew. That's right. Nobody suspected uh -huh. that this was God manifest in the flesh. Mm -hmm. and, no, and it isn't today either. Your ideal life is a testimony, but it's not enough testimony. Amen. It's not enough to prove that you're in Christ. It's not enough to prove that you're one of God's. It's not enough. You, yeah. More proof is needed than that. Just as, If this is true of Jesus, it's much more yeah. true of us. Now, at some point, Jesus' brethren did mm -hmm. come to believe in him. At first, they didn't. John 2.12, after the wedding feast of the Canaan of Galilee, where he turned water into wine, and the evidence is that his brothers were there and saw this. It says, of it, immediately after that, he went down to Capernaum with his brothers and his disciples. And this word is added... that they did not yet believe on him. Yeah. Uh -huh. He's 30, wrought this first miracle. They did not yet uh, believe on him. But at some point, as I say, they did. When Jesus rose from the dead, we don't know when they did. At some point, when Jesus rose from the dead, some women had come to the tomb, you remember? They were met by angels, and the angels told them to bring his disciples' word. On their way, they meet Jesus, or Jesus meets them on the way. And he says, don't be afraid. Go tell my brethren. Tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there they shall see me. In other words, you wish we say it's a brother Jason? Go, go ahead and finish the, the words, his brethren occur eight times in Scripture. They had never applied to the disciples. I know he said, they that my, who are my mother and my brother, they hear the word of God and keep it. But Jesus never called his disciples, categorically, his, his brethren. So I'm saying this, we know this was the case, that they did believe, because he made a special post-resurrection appearance to James. Yeah. It wasn't of the James and John James, because that James was killed in Acts 12. He was, he was killed. So it wasn't, post-resurrection appearance wasn't to that James. We understand it was to this James, who was a key person in the church at at Jerusalem. At, go ahead, Brother Jason. Yeah, the, a lot of people have noticed, if you read through the Gospels, you notice, and, and it, it, it can be kind of strange that Jesus didn't just go around telling people, hey, I'm the Son of God, <laughs> or I'm the Christ. He, yeah. he didn't do that. In fact, he told them, don't tell anybody. Uh -huh. yeah. mm -hmm. Yes, and there's been a... There's been a lot of New Testament scholars who have written a lot about this, mm -hmm. this curious uh, thing, and they've, they've reached different conclusions. But I remember reading some scholars, and I think this is helpful. Some scholars have said the reason why, Je there's a couple reasons why Jesus didn't just go around telling everybody, you know, just publicly saying, I'm the Son of God, or I'm God in the flesh, or I'm the Christ. Mm -hmm. One reason is because there were too many misunderstandings about what the Christ was going to be and to do. Yeah, that's good. It's like when it's like remember when they tried to make Jesus king, king after yeah. he made, multiplied mm -hmm. the loaves there in John six. Jesus wasn't going to have anything to do with that. He wasn't going to be the kind of Christ the people wanted him to be. Uh -huh. yeah. He was going to be the kind of Christ God wanted him to be. Amen. The, the second reason that this that this wasn't like broadcast during Jesus' ministry is because the full revelation of who Jesus is is only correctly understood 
in the context of his death and resurrection. Yes, resurrection. Mm -hmm. That's right. So he had to he had something he had to accomplish. That's right. And mm -hmm. then after that, they didn't even even after he was raised, they didn't still they still didn't understand. Yes. Mm -hmm. it, it took it took the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, I think, to kind of open it up. Yeah. He spent mm -hmm. forty days showing them many infallible proofs yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That, that it was him. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That, that especially fortifies the fact that there was nothing about his appearance that led people to this conclusion that he was the Son of God. So the half-brother of Jesus, the other one, James, he wrote the book of James. So here's two half-brothers. Each one wrote a book that's been canonized, and James was a was a chief, he was a, a one, not just one of the chief, he was a chief leader uh -huh, yeah. at the Jerusalem church right. where the apostles attended. And he said, I'm, I'm a, but he didn't say, and I'm a half-brother of Jesus. He said, I'm a servant. I'm a servant yeah, that's right. of Jesus Christ. He, <laughs> he was raised in the same house with him. Yeah came to believe on him. He didn't he didn't know Jesus after the flesh. See, we are, we know not Jesus after the flesh. Jude didn't either. He was a servant of Jesus Christ. See, one's relationship or identity with Christ trumps all other relationships. Servant of Christ trumps brother yeah. or half brother yeah. or mother. Trumps it. Even uh, see this. Uh, even though the Christ's association is later, it's it's first. The spiritual identity is always first, even though it came into being second. Mm -hmm. Jesus was a second man, but he's the most important yeah, right. man. Isaac trumped Ishmael, mm -hmm. right? Jacob trumped Esau. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jesus trumped Adam. Yeah. The new covenant trumps the old covenant. Mm -hmm. The new man trumps the old man. The resurrection body trumps this body. See, it's a consistent all through Scripture. The spiritual trumps the natural. The new creation takes the precedence over the natural order. A professing believer should be able to correlate that with their manner of life. You can't claim identity with Jesus and your natural life gets more time and more devotion and more attention and more of you than God does. Amen. God will not accept this. Amen. I'm serious. I'm just, God will not accept this. Say, well, well, I have to work more on the job. You work on your job for Jesus. Yes. That's the answer to this. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. See, that's why you do that. Because you cannot give your employer more than you give Jesus. And if you give it all to Jesus, you'll be the best employee your employer ever had. That's right. You know, I know some people may think, well, he would have had some kind of advantage being Jesus' half-brother. But see, it doesn't work that way. It Not only did it not give him any eternal advantage, it... it Sometimes it can actually be a hindrance That's right. exactly. because you see, you, you, you have a sense, you got to get over seeing them in the flesh because you're so familiar with them. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he's a servant of Jesus Christ. That's the capacity he's writing this in. Mm -hmm. And I'm a brother. Yeah. I'm James' brother. Yeah. James isn't my brother. I'm James. Yeah. See, James, when he wrote his epistle, he didn't say a brother to Jude. Because James had been ranked higher yeah. by divine placement. 
In saying I'm a brother of James, he seems to recognize James' preeminence in the church. It's interesting to note that both James and Jude, among Jesus' brethren, were vitally concerned about the state of the church. Isn't that interesting? Both of them, James' epistle, you remember what he both of them were concerned about the state and condition of the church. That's, that's very, very arresting to me. We understand that James wrote about 62 A.D. Jude wrote a little later, about 64 to 66 A.D. Paul wrote to Corinth, one of the earliest bits, about 52 A.D. That means before 70 A.D., which is about 27 years after Christ's ascension, a de defection was already taking place. Already the church was beginning to ter deteriorate. James saw it, Jude saw it, Paul saw it in, Gal in the churches in Galatia, saw it in Corinth. Already, already a deterioration had set in, but apparently not many saw it. Jude saw it. He saw sort of a backward stance developing. I've got to confess to you that sometimes I wish I wasn't this sensitive. This, uh, this causes a great weight to my soul. It's not, it's not quite the sort of thing you could just get on and rebuke. It's not that, it's just, it'll shift in emphasis, it'll shift in devotion, it'll shift in commitment to the Lord. Jude's all about that. A great falling away hadn't occurred, but he saw it was on the way. We got to do something about it. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, and in that order, in that order, to them that are, not were, to them that are sanctified by God the Father, to them, to them. Other versions say to those or to all who have been, Living Bible says to Christians everywhere, International English says to the people, we're writing to them that are sanctified. Scripture's not written to be embalmed in a library. It's written to somebody, not just for general and unspecified consumption is written to everybody who falls in this category, sanctified by God the Father, should be familiar with this epistle because it's written to them. That is addressed, Scripture is addressed to people who are familiar with God and familiar with Scripture. Prior to Moses, there was no inspired writing to anyone. Not to anyone. Adam didn't get a book. Enoch didn't have a book. Noah didn't get a book. Only when God had a people did he write a book. Certainly makes sense for those it, it does, makes, makes sense that those in Christ have an inspired word, yeah. that have an inspired word to be familiar with that word. Amen. You wouldn't think of being a member of a family away from home when your mother or your sisters or somebody wrote you a letter and you filed it away, didn't read it. Someone would say, well, something's wrong there. Yeah. But that's happening all the time in the Christian world. And we understand Jude, as, as I've said, to be a general epistle like Hebrews, 1st and 2nd Peter and James. These were particular people, but they weren't in a cluster. See, they were... Isn't that something that Jude thought to do this? 
James thought to do this. Paul in Hebrews thought to do this. Peter thought to do this. He didn't write to somebody in a specific city. He wrote, isn't that something? He thought to do that. That means that these Christians were in communication with one another. Somebody got hold of these letters and made sure they got around. Got around to the brethren. Now these are these he addresses it to the those that are sanctified. <clears throat> There's a little bit of difference in some of the versions here. Some read the beloved of God, who are loved by God, who are beloved in God, those of God's selection, sanctified by God, wrapped in God, the love of God the Father, those who are dear to God the Father, and dearly loved by God the Father, and separated or set apart. See, it's different. So there's two trains of thought here. One that sanctified really means loved or beloved. That variance is owing to some difference in the manuscripts, the famous manuscript problem. Some manuscripts use a word that means beloved of God or loved by God and are dear to God. Now there's a significant difference in representation of sanctified and beloved. There's a significant difference in those two words. The language is are, not were, mm -hmm. are, sanctified, a state that existed. Mm. Now the fact that, that uh, the love of God, that I'm writing to those that are loved by God, this doesn't comport with apostolic doctrine. You don't write to people that are in a decline, mm -hmm. that's not what you tell them. Yeah. That's not a strong enough foundation because that that foundation is the very thing that's in question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm saying the condition that Jude addressed would not be adequately addressed. He had to go back and provide a solid foundation to call these people out of that. To call these people out of that, there had to be a solid foundation that he yeah. laid for the people. Sanctified has to do with setting apart for the purpose of dedication and use. And the languages are sanctified, a state that existed, in this case, prior to their calling. <clears throat> it existed prior to their calling. Now I want to develop this some. The Epistle of the Hebrews affirms that in Jesus' death he sanctified the people. Not after his death, in, in mm -hmm. his death, he sanctified the people. Hebrews 10.10 10 says, by the which will, we, that's the will Jesus came to do. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Again, Hebrews 13.12, for by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Hebrews yes. 10, 14. Hebrews 13, 12. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Now, when that sanctification is actually realized, mm -hmm. it is by faith. Amen. It's not by blood that it's realized. It's by faith. Yeah, amen. Sanctified by faith. Yeah, otherwise everyone would be sanctified. That's exactly right. Yeah, amen. Sanctified by faith is in me. But you've got to see that the setting apart was done before the call. That's, yeah, the point. Yeah. That's what I'm going to, yeah. going to establish here. <clears throat> Were it not for what it was accomplished at the cross of Christ, all efforts to purify ourselves would be in vain. Mm -hmm. Something happened there yeah. when sin was... There was a preservation, a keeping that took place at that, at that time, a sanctification, a setting apart. It took place at that time. Those who were sanctified were the ones that were given to Jesus. Amen. Jesus talked about the people that God gave him. Yeah. These were the people mm -hmm. that were sanctified, set apart to be given to Jesus. 
Doctrinally, the sanctification accomplished at the cross and leading us to the experienced sanctification is stated this way. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Yeah. It's this sanctification that enables the people to live for him instead of themselves. Amen. And then that they're working out, mm -hmm. in a practical sense, the sanctification, the sanctified life, which is Romans 6. What I'm showing here is that the sanctification, the sanctification Jude's talking about preceded the call, and that's what made you a workable, yeah, workable in the hands of the Lord. Yeah. He's in this sense that sanctification is said to have already been accomplished. Several texts, 1 Corinthians 1, 2, 6, 11, Hebrews 2, 12 says you are yeah. sanctified. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second, by the which will we are sanctified. The far as being set aside to God, it's already been done. Amen. In the sense of this text, it's already been done. And the work is proceeding because yeah. it has been done. That is, all the variables are with men. Yeah. None of them are with God. Amen. God doesn't have to do one more thing to make you acceptable. Mm -hmm. Nor does Jesus. That they've done what's they've now what they, you've got to believe that and proceed upon the basis of it. You were gonna say something about the blood. I want to get back, back to the blood. Mm -hmm. uh, and the work was the blood that made us effective. That's and we're right. sanctified by faith in the blood of Christ. That's it, right. I mean without the blood, mm -hmm. then uh, can I say that uh, what what would the faith do if we didn't it, have the yeah, work? If we didn't right. have that blood mm -hmm. to do that work. Yeah, it wouldn't. Yeah. Faith in the blood. The blood is everything. So far as a, the appropriation of this is, yeah. but before Jesus could commence His work, yeah. uh -huh. the people had to be given to Him. Right. Yes. Amen. They had to be given to Him first. Mm -hmm. But to be given to Him, they had to be sanctified. <laughs> And only the death of Christ could do that. Sanctified by God the Father, the whole of salvation, he is of God from beginning to end. So he's reasoning with these now. He's reasoning with this. If there is defection, it cannot possibly be because of some deficiency on God's part. Right. It can't be that the sanctification that was wrought by Christ was partial. It can't be that. It can't be that the price wasn't adequate. Or that you really did not belong to God. Or that you really weren't given to Christ. It, it can't be because of that. It has to be on your part that you didn't have faith to accept that. Because faith is the catalyst that causes this to go into, go into action or activity. God is the one who made Christ to be unto us righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. He's the one that placed us in the body of Christ because we were sanctified by the offering of Jesus Christ. He's the one that gave us a measure of faith because we were sanctified, set apart. He's the one that translated us into the kingdom of his dear son and delivered us from the power of darkness because we were sanctified by the offering yes. of Jesus Christ. Once mm -hmm. at Amen. that time. Amen. Amen. That put the, that started the project off. Yeah. And I say, well, how are we to know who these are? Well, it's not for you to know who these are. Yeah. You, the only thing you can know is who, if you are. Amen. And he tells you your faith will show you what Jesus did. And once you see it, Satan loses his power. He cannot work with a person who knows they were sanctified by the offering of the body of Christ once for all. He can't contend with that because his head was bruised at the same place. He knows it. He doesn't, uh, doesn't want us to know it. 
So because of the sanctification that occurred, that, see, that's a great truth to see. I, you, you, I know as you mull this over, it'll open up more and more to you. That God's righteous, see, he can't proceed on a work with a bunch of sloppy yeah. plans and purposes. <laughs> he has to prepare the people to give them to Christ so Christ can wash them and cleanse them and bring them back uh, to God. Amen. Sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Now again, here the versions are quite different. Called and preserved, the New King James says, who are called and kept for Jesus, New American Standard, who have been called and kept by Jesus, NIV, who are called and kept safe for Jesus, the National New Revised Standard Version, who are kept safe for Jesus, Basic Bible, English, which are called and sanctified of God the Father and returned to Jesus. That's the Geneva Bible. Call, called, wrapped up in the love of God, for God Father and kept for Jesus. Keeps you safe in the care of, Jesus, of Christ. Beloved of God and chosen by Him. Kept for Jesus Christ and called. To those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. And the literal translation is having been kept to Jesus Christ. What's the, liter what's the uh, literal interpretation of the Bible text says? The sequence is represented see, in different ways. Most later versions have the calling taking place before the preservation. But this is not the point he's making. He's laying the foundation here. Yeah. And this doesn't blend well with the rest of the verse. Jude has lifted our vision into the council chambers of God. Yeah, amen. Yeah. And he's, he's going to reason from up there. He's going to reason from up there. They are sanctified by God the Father. And they preserve, they're not preserved, they are preserved in Christ Jesus. That is true, but that's not what Jude is saying here. He's saying they were preserved for. Now this tells us how you lasted from your birth to your new birth. Okay, this explains it. This explains how the patriarchs endured this life and still the blood of Christ purged him. This explains why Paul made it from Saul to Paul. They were preserved for Christ. See, when they when God gave them to Christ, he had preserved them up. You think Satan didn't try and take these people out? Because all these people Jesus called, they were devout people. He didn't call drunkards and people like that to be his servants. He called devout people. How did they how did they last? How did they make? He were preserved Amen. for Christ. You were too. Yeah. Amen. You were preserved for Christ. You Amen. owe to God a thanks Amen. that you didn't die before you came to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Oh, see, that's a great <laughs> that's a great truth. Having been preserved is the idea. Something that's already taken place. You are sanctified, having been preserved, and then you were called. Amen. Now see, this agrees perfectly with Romans 8. Uh, yeah. Whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Mm -hmm. Whom he foreknew, he justified. Whom he justified... Whom he, whom he foreknew, uh -huh. whom he foreknew, yeah. he called. All right. Right. We're, we're, at the, we're at the foreknew here, see? Uh -huh. We're at the foreknew. That's right. He called, whom he called, and he justified. Uh -huh. Yes.
accusing definitely didn't like take place like just prior to the call. That's right. I mean, it's you were chosen before the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. So like it's good to know that the preservation that's like something that was just planned beforehand. Yeah. <clears throat> like he he already knew what had to take place in order for you to get to this place you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Let's flesh this out. Let's flesh this out a little more. He did. He foreknew, but see, it was formalized at cry at the cross. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. That justified mm -hmm. God in preserving Amen. in preserving the people. Yes. Mm -hmm. If Jesus hadn't have died, yeah. the the preservation would have been could not have been justified. Right. But He died, Amen. and we were sanctified. Yeah. We were sanctified by that, and could be preserved because of that offering. So even. Even his election and predestination uh -huh. is because of Jesus. Amen. You take Jesus out of the scenario, uh -huh. and God doesn't talk about his election and predestination That's apart right. from Christ. Oh, yeah. It was before the world. Amen. It was before the world in purpose. Amen. Now, isn't this part of what Jesus meant when he said, how then will the scriptures be fulfilled if he didn't go to the cross? That's right. Or he said, I could call angels, but then how would the scripture be fulfilled? Yeah. How would this, everything that had been prophesied, everything that had been laid out, even election and predestination, it wouldn't get done. Yeah. Yes, I, yeah, I think he goes back further than that, though, here. He goes back further than that. I don't think God didn't have in mind, well, he, I mean, it is that he didn't know, but God didn't have in mind, I'm going to save these. I'm going to save these people. That, that's not what drove this. It, I'm going to set these people apart. The Lord knows them that are His, and I'm gonna I'm gonna set them apart by the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. I'm gonna I'm gonna set them apart, and then when, then He began to talk about this uh, quite a bit. This, this verse has always intrigued me in reference to what you're talking about here. Just one four says, according yeah. as yeah. He has chosen us in Him. Yeah, yeah. Four and five Foundation. Well, I've heard it said that when that when that divine purpose and plan was orchestrated by the Godhead, that mm -hmm. that's when the people of God was given to Christ, and and that and that preordained, that predestined time, the election of God was actually established at that time. Well, here now, here's how here's that how it, it was works. Promised to Christ. They were actually given to Christ after they were sanctified. They, they, after they were sanctified, they were given to they were given to Christ. In purpose, they belonged to Christ. He chose us in Him. But the sanctification, which had to do with setting them apart, that was actually accomplished at the death of Christ. It was purposed before the foundation of the world. But it had to be worked out. It was that complicated. Of, it was that complicated of a thing. God couldn't look at sinners and merely determine that he was going to save them and then do it. That would, that would not have been, his righteousness would not have been exonerated. He had to first of all set them apart. And he did that of old time in anticipation of Christ's death. But when Christ died, the setting apart actually took place. Chosen in him before the foundation of the world. See, that's why Tars Saul of Tarsus survived yes, until the road to Damascus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's all he, why he did. Mm -hmm. Now that now J Jude's going to spend his epistle now reasoning on this on this basis. In view of this, retrogression does not make sense. It doesn't make sense that something that satisfied God wouldn't satisfy those that participated in it. This, this is a foolish and absurd uh -huh. assumption. And Jude sees that this is the point they hadn't seen. Uh -huh. This is how defects have started to take place. They, they weren't earnestly contending for the faith because this was not clear. Well, it's, I've known this for some years, and it's still getting clearer. This is a, this is this is not a simplistic 
type thing. That's right. All of this so God would be just and the justifier, see. I think I'll close there. Any of you have any, something you'd like to add? Very weighty text. Yeah. The uh, same language is used for Israel. That's right. When, when, they were, when they were at Sinai. That's right. He said, I've set you apart. That's right. Sanctified you. That's right. You're a people. You're, out of all the nations of the world, he told them, I've set my affection on That's you. That's right. Mm -hmm. Not because you're better. No. Or more. Than all the others. Yeah. You know? But that's what he did with this. See, that's a picture of that's a picture of God's purpose. Amen. And he did it with blood there too. Remember? Yeah. Amen. He did it with blood also. Yeah. Brother Gavin. Yes. I said that scripture wasn't written to be embalmed in a library. I thought what faith needs to act is a word from God. And if we were to put the word of God on a shelf and claim that it's too holy for us to read, then you're too far off base because if what God had to say was too holy for us to hear or read, then he wouldn't have given it to us. But he has given it to us and we have to take advantage and read it because that's what gives our faith ability to act. That's right. Mm -hmm. A person wonders if, uh, if I wonder, well, is Christ able to keep me? This is because God sanctified the people before he gave them to him. Uh -huh. See, so this, this, the, pro the process of salvation has all been thought out very well. And the people who have faith, they're just sanctified by faith. The people who have faith see there is no need for me to fall away or go backward. And they, get, they begin to see this because your salvation is only as sure to you as you can what you can, as you can see this. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Just, just uh, Jason. We have a lot of trouble today with people uh, who are not sanctified oh. in the church, and uh, this this has got to be due to the fact that the cross. The cross is yeah. not clear to people. Yeah, it's not that people haven't heard about the cross; they don't understand the implications. They That's don't. Right. They don't understand why Jesus died. That's right. They're, I mean, who doesn't know that Christians believe Jesus died on the cross? But, but people don't know why. Mm -hmm. They don't know why he died, they, and they don't know what he accomplished when he died. That's mm -hmm. right. And this has to be made clear through the preaching. See, God is. Yeah. It's through the mm -hmm. foolishness of the preaching, preaching that right. God saves them that believe. So this, right. if if the if what happened when Jesus died isn't unpacked by preaching, people aren't going to get it by osmosis. That's right. right. Mm -hmm. It's not that easily seen. No. Uh huh. It, it kind of ties into the fact that he, Jesus' brothers couldn't see who he was just by observation. The same is true of observing Scripture. You can't just figure it all out. It's not that way. It has to be opened up. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead, Anna. I liked when you said that no matter what we are doing, we should do it for Christ and we should serve Him. If we serve Christ and can work for Him, we will be rewarded with something much more than gold or silver. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yes, amen. Don't you, go ahead, Brother Aaron. You mentioned the controversial nature of, of some of these things. I think that in a lot of cases, people have, have trouble with things that God does when it touches them, mm -hmm. as, as opposed to you know not having trouble with God creating the world and, and things like this. But then when it, has, when it, when it touches implicates their choice, their their will. It, you know, it's kind of like uh, the issue that the Lord made with Job. It says, you know, he was upset. Job, speaking in my own words, Job was unsettled by things that happened to him that he didn't understand. Mm -hmm. But the Lord, he reasoned with Job, saying, "There's, a, you're surrounded by things that you don't understand. Mm -hmm. You're not, you're not troubled by those things until something touches you right. that you don't understand." Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of the same principle Amen. of 
the, uh, why people have trouble with God's choice is when it, because it touches them. Yes, and amen. All, all three of these things in this text that you that you touched on are things that God does to men. That's right. Sanctified, preserved, mm -hmm. and called. It's not sanctified, persevering, and called. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's sanctified, preserved, and called. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's interesting that theological scholars up to a point in time didn't seem to have a lot of trouble with this text. <laughs> but a little after 1700, it's a different way of thinking was introduced that made it hard to accept. This, if you just if you just took the grammar, the Greek grammar, everybody knew what it said. But now, now you've got a theology that's been formed. They're trying to fit this into the. It, right. It's like a square going in a round hole. It just it just doesn't yeah. doesn't fit in there. So men, you would think what men would do, they'd trim the theology. But instead, they widen the hole. Yeah. I was going to say, too, that mo having trouble with these, these kind of texts comes real close to uh, implicating God with error. Cool. If, if, if not just doing it, if not just blaming him mm -hmm. altogether of doing, of doing wrong. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know of any other explanation if, if this can't be received that God calls and that God preserves then it is uh, it's, it's saying somehow that God has done something wrong yeah, is there mm -hmm. unrighteousness when God yeah. Paul, Paul poses that very question mm -hmm. yes with Jonathan anything that God sets apart he's going to use for his glory it's not arbitrary. There's like a work in mind when he sets That's something right. apart. And That's right. He's going to make that thing fit for whatever he's doing. Like just one example is it says the principalities and powers are what is seeing the wisdom of God in the church. Like he set it apart for this, like for that use, displaying his wisdom, amongst other things. So yeah, part of the sanctifying process is he's 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 separating it, but he's making it fit for a certain That's work. That's right. Amen. Yeah. When you understand what the work is, yeah. That's something that mm. needs to be opened up, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sister Ada, you had something? Oh, yes. If, uh, if someone's going to argue that we're, a person is able to choose for themselves to follow the Lord, then that would give some credence to any kind of carnal or fleshly asset a person might have. And if anybody had that, it would have been Jude being mm -hmm. a, a brother yeah. Yeah. of Jesus. But... And not, and not even coming forth to identify himself in that way. He's not exalting himself in any way over his brethren. He's, it's as if he is saying, I, I am associated with Christ the same way anyone else mm -hmm. right. is ever associated with Christ. Mm -hmm. And it's by his calling. See, if, you, if, if, people, if people's own perception has led them into a state of weakness, mm -hmm. you can't appeal to their perception mm -hmm. as as a basis for solidity. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, Jason. I was just thinking back to your introduction uh, about the purpose of this, this little letter as a whole. Mm -hmm. and, and he's writing here to the those who are sanctified and preserving Jesus. That doesn't mean that everybody in those churches was this. Mm -hmm. No. And it illustrates this 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 right. uh, it illustrates the fact that that the what we call the church or the church in the world mm -hmm. is a it's a mixed multitude. Mm -hmm. Like when they came out like when they came out of Egypt there was a there was a mixed mm -hmm. multitude. Yeah. And Jude's going to point that out. He says you've allowed people That's in. Right. Mm -hmm. You're right. They come in and they they don't have any business being in there, mm -hmm. but they're there. And that's the situation we have. We've had on this situation in our hands from the very beginning mm -hmm. of the first century. There are people in the church who call themselves Christians, who want to be a part of the church. They have no business being in there. They don't manifest any of the fruit mm -hmm. of being saved. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what he's addressing. Mm -hmm. But he's addressing here the sanctified people. And then when the church was at 
getting started, God worked so that people like that didn't dare join himself to yeah, remember. Right, yeah. They didn't dare join himself to the uh -huh. early church as it was as it was picking up strength. Uh -huh. They're cleaned out of there. Yeah. Well, you know, that's two ways of seeing that though. Now they don't belong in there, but because they're there, then you begin to wonder if you belong in there. You see, so I mean, you might have to just get out of there. In other words, well, you, have to, you, you know, after a while. Yeah. So you can't justify a mixed multitude. Then you might, if they, if they don't, you know, if that don't get corrected, you might have to depart yeah, from well, that. Yeah. Well, the, the, the thing he's pointing out is you got to detect it before they're the majority. Yeah, they can't grow unless the church, they can't explode unless the church lets them. And that's, that's what he's writing about here. That's what he warns them about. Amen. Do you think that the difficulty with understanding God's choices and God's keeping us and so forth, the change in that coincides with the rise of American political philosophy? Oh, no, I don't know. It rolled before that, yeah. This is just how this is how flesh reasons, yeah. even from the beginning. But it has been aided and abetted by the talk of freedom and this sort of thing. It's been aided by that. Don't no question that at all. Yeah, we've got a we've got a climate where, for God to work in this climate, it's going to take a lot. For this, to, for this to take place. So who, whoever is, no limit with God to save with many or few. Mm -hmm. But there has to be that few that see that see this mm -hmm. and are willing to abandon all other competing interests and put their hand on the plow and not look back. Mm -hmm. And then God can use a Jude or somebody like this to mm -hmm. address the situation, but that's got to happen, and the current religious structure is not tailored to produce that kind of attitude. It's just too casual. Yeah. Yeah, the, point, the point I was making is that the, the infiltration was apparently passively yes. allowed. That's right. Uh -huh. That, that's that's the problem that Jude's that Jude's addressing. That's right. Mm -hmm. The old leaven has to be purged up, but to be purged out, you gotta you gotta catch it. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Otherwise, the whole the whole thing is corrupt, and you it's got to be abandoned. Yeah. yeah. All right. We'll have a closing word of prayer. Our heavenly Father, we do thank you for this book of Jude and for its solemnity. We pray you give us grace to understand it and then also to take heed to all of the various admonitions that are contained in it. In Jesus' name, amen.